book of Judges. Um, again, I had a message to preach, and the Lord told me no. And so I, I didn't have time to... Uh, this is a first draft, okay? So I didn't have time to finesse this or uh, put it together in a creative fashion. I don't have a lot of funny stories today. I'm just going to share what the Lord has laid on my heart. The book of Judges will begin in chapter 6. We'll finish in chapter 7 of a familiar passage. But I first want to read the words... All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus. Take me now. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me fill thy Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. All to Jesus, I surrender. Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. Oh. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years, and the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. Verse 3. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midians and the Amalekites, or Amalekites sorry, and the people of the east would come up against them. And they would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts. Pay attention to the writing of this passage. Come up like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord, and when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. The Amalekites were a thorn in the flesh for many years for the Israelites. They descended from Eliphaz, son of Esau, in Genesis chapter 16. They were from southern Canaan, south through the Sinai Peninsula. Their kings bore the title Agag. Agag meant fiery one or violent in 1 Samuel chapter 15. 
the first nation to oppose Israel after the Exodus in Exodus chapter 17. They're defeated as, as Moses, Aaron, and Hur were up on the mountain and Joshua led Israel in the battle, fought in the valley. There was to be perpetual enmity between Israel and Amalek. And in Numbers chapter 14, in the league with the Canaanites, they defeated Israel's absorptive attempt to enter Canaan after they had been refused leave to do so. The first campaign against Israel in the land was found in Judges chapter 3 with the Moabites and the Ammonites. They captured Jericho. The second campaign against Israel is found in Judges chapter 6 as we read. Together with the Midianites and the children of the east, they greatly impoverished, the word says, Israel. But they were defeated by Gideon. In 1 Samuel chapter 14 and 15, we read about Saul's campaign against them. But Saul's failure to slay them completely contributed to his being rejected as king. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, we read about David defeating an Amalekite force. And in 2 Samuel chapter 8, David subdues them. It says that the silver and the gold he had taken from them was dedicated to the Lord. In 1 Chronicles chapter 4, we finally read of their demise. It says the remnant of the Amalekites were smitten by the Simeonites. We do, however, read in Esther chapter 3, Haman, the Agagite, Agagite, oh, I can't pronounce that, appears to be surviving. The Amalekites were thorns. And the Amalekites and the Amidianites would every year ravish the crops of the Israelites. Now the angel of the Lord, verse 11, came and sat under the terebinth at Orphrah, I almost said Oprah, Orphrah, which belonged to Joash, the Ab, 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 Ab somebody pronounced that, <laughs> Ab is right. Well, he was a right, okay, we'll just say that. While his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And if I could ask one question today as the topic of our sermon, it's this. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? There seems to be this, and we've talked about this before, and it's not, it's not an original thought, but it's in Scripture, this S cycle for Israel. They would sin and they would... Uh, get sorry and well they would first get sad because they would deal have to deal with the consequences and then they would get sorry and then uh they would get sanctified and then they would be they would sin again there was just constant s cycle for israel throughout scripture and you read that at the beginning of judges the middle of judges the end of judges when the scripture says in those days israel had no king everyone did what was right in his own eyes old testament secular humanism. And we find in verse 11 of chapter 6, the angel of the Lord comes to the son of what appears to almost be a priest of the Midianites. After all, he has an idol right in his own home. And Gideon is beating out the wheat in the wine press. And as I studied that, when you threshed wheat, winnowed, different words, you would take your grain after you harvest it from the field. And at the threshing floor, you would separate the wheat from the chaff, the bad part, the husk, from your grain, so your grain would be pure. 
And this is how it would work. You would take your pitchfork and you would toss the grain up into the air and you would let the wind carry the chaff away because it didn't weigh as much. And then your good kernels of grain would fall down to the ground. But to do this, most of the Israelites, you would climb to a higher place and you would let the natural wind blow through and carry away the chaff, and you would be left with the good grain. But what is Gideon doing? He's in the wine press. Wine presses were naturally at the lowest point, where as you crushed the grapes, the juice would flow naturally into the low point where they would gather for their wine. It's in the ground. Gideon is at his lowest point when what he's doing calls for him to be at his highest point, separating the wheat from the chaff. He's hiding. It doesn't say it in this verse, but later in the passage, it very much specifies he is afraid. If I could go just a little bit deeper this morning and contrasting the wine press with the threshing floor. Isaiah chapter 5, and Eli, if you could pull these up fast for me. I know I just told you this. Again, these are not in my notes. But Isaiah chapter 5, could you put up verses 1 through 7 for me? And then I'm going to go to Isaiah 63. I want us quickly, if we can, um, let me just go over there real quick. This is important, or I would not stop to read this. Isaiah chapter 5. It says in verse 1 of chapter 5, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill, referring to God and Israel. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed it a wine vat in it. And he looked to it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done to it? Yet when I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall. It shall be trampled down. I will make it waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and breeze and thorns shall grow up. I will command the clouds that they rain, that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Now, if you go over to chapter 63, Hold on, church. We'll preach in a minute. I just want to read this. Verse 1 of chapter 63 of Isaiah. Who is this who comes from Edom in crimson garments of Bozrah, referring to a messianic prophecy, who is splendid in his apparel, matching in the greatness of his strength? It is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red? And your garments like his who what? Treads in the wine press. I have trodden the wine press alone. And from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. You see... If you haven't got the picture already, as we read these passages in Isaiah, the winepress of God is a picture of his wrath, of his fury. You go on over to the book of Revelation, chapter 14. 
I'm sorry, guys. This is not, I told you this is a rough draft. Revelation chapter 14, but I really believe this is important. What are you afraid of? Verse 14 of chapter 14 of Revelation. Then I looked and behold a white cloud. Now I want you to pay attention, church, because something here just absolutely opened up this week for me. Seated on a cloud, one like the Son of Man with a golden crown on his head and sharp sickle in his hand. A sharp sickle. What is happening? What is a sickle? Do we know what a sickle is? It's for harvesting wheat. So now we have a picture of a harvest, but in just a moment, keep reading. Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And Another angel came out from the altar. The angel has authority over the fire. He called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle from the earth and gathered the grapes, harvest of the earth, and threw it into the what? The great wine press of what? The wrath of God. Gideon is trying to thresh in the wine press. What? Lord, please help me this morning. Some of us here today are in the wine press when we need to be on the hill. Let me just say it. When we need to be on the hill, threshing. Now let me say that in terms that hopefully. Right now is the time for us not to be under the wrath of God, but to allow the wind of the Holy Spirit to remove the chaff within our hearts. But something for many of us keeps us in the winepress of his wrath when he does not want us to be in the winepress of his wrath. He wants us on the hill, allowing the move of the Holy Spirit to blow away the chaff in our lives. What has kept you in the winepress? What are you afraid of? Hidden sin. Psalm 98, 90 verse 8 says, You have set our wrongdoing before you, our secret sins in the light of your face. Secret sin will keep us in the wine press. Jeremiah 16, 17 and 18 says, I see everything they do. They cannot hide from me the things they do. Their sin is not hidden from my eyes. Regrets will keep us in the wine press. Intimidation and insecurity and stubbornness will keep us in the wine press. You say, Brandon, I have felt crushed and I have felt crushed and I have felt crushed. God doesn't want us in this crushing press. He wants us on the hill, the holy hill he has, that the wind of the Holy Spirit would begin to separate the flesh and the spirit in our lives and remove those things from us. The threshing floor of his presence. You winnow on a threshing floor and you press grapes at the wine press. But fear keeps us locked in a place where we weren't supposed to be doing something that we weren't supposed to do. 
And meanwhile, Gideon's dad has an Asherah in his backyard offering to the false gods of Baal and the Midianites. And God tells Gideon, he shows up. Am I putting you all to sleep? He shows up in verse 12. The angel of the Lord, a Christophany, because some translations actually capitalize angel. Very well could have been Jesus himself showing up and looking at Gideon in the wine press and saying to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Don't you love Jesus sees us what we can be before we're that? He calls things beautiful when we don't see any beauty. He calls things strong when we feel weak. He calls things, calls things pure when we're dirty. He calls things full of light when it's dark because he sees the end. But hidden sin can keep us in the wine press. Number two, hidden talents can keep us in the wine press. But God sees the son of a Midianite priest named Gideon and declared future over him. O oh, mighty man of valor. Today, the Lord may be speaking to you in this place and say, I am with you, O oh, mighty man of valor. O oh, daughter of valor. I am with you. Matthew 25, we know the parable of the talents. He gave one and two and five, and he blessed those who used them and took them away from the ones who did not. Are your buried talents keeping you in the wine press? What are you afraid of? Second Timothy, Paul wrote, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. So if you walk in fear, no, it is not the spirit of God. Hidden talents. Number three. I love this because there's one thing that will pull us out of the wine press. And it is revealed relationship. Revealed relationship. This Christophany, as God himself, Jesus meets Gideon in the wine press. It says in verse 19 of chapter 6, So Gideon went into his house. Man, we may have to finish this sermon next week. I don't know. And prepared a young goat and eleven cakes from an ephah a flower, an ephah a flower. The meat he put in a basket, and the broth he put in a pot, and brought them to him under the terebinth, and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, "Take the meat and the unleavened cakes, and put them on this rock, and pour the broth over them." And he did so. And the angel of the Lord reached out to the tip of the staff that was in his hand, and touched the meat and the eleven cakes, and fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cake. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Now I need to do a little more research, but it's my understanding that God himself con consumes the sacrifice. He's the consumer. He is the all-consuming fire. Then Gideon perceived that he was the, the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Revealed relationship. Relationship is revealed through communion through communion and this is more than just the cracker and the juice even though we take that here periodically to reflect and remember I mean deeper than that I mean our communion with Jesus revealed relationship do you have daily communion with Jesus in Luke 19, 13 through 15, we read the story of the two on the road to Emmaus. 
and how God, Jesus himself, spoke of all the Old Testament law of Moses and the prophets. And they felt something, but they didn't know yet. And then they took communion together as he took the bread, blessed the bread, broke it, and gave it to them. And then he vanished from their sight, and they said their eyes were opened. And he was made known to them through the breaking of the bread. You see, religion is outcome driven. Relationship is the process because Jesus isn't just about outcome that I would answer this prayer and I would do this for you and this for you and this for you. Jesus wants to know us and for him, for us to know him and him to know us. It's a relationship. If Jesus would have told the two up front who he was, they wouldn't have got the history lesson and the special communion prior to the revelation because they just would have been sitting there going, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. But then afterwards, they realized looking back all along, it was him. In our life, there may be moments where he hasn't fully revealed it yet, but he is guiding us through relationship every step of the way. And one day we will look back and we will say, didn't our hearts burn within us? Peace came to Gideon when he realized that it was the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ himself, that was meeting him face to face. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, verse 24, the Lord is peace. Wow. To go from hiding in a wine press to now having confidence to say the Lord is peace. Wow. And now chapter 7, Gideon is challenged. Did you know that you are not intended to be the hero of your story. I am not intended to be the hero of my story. God is intended to be the hero of your story and the hero of my story. Three things we read about in chapter 7 as God prepares Gideon to defeat the Midianites. And I'll tell you what, we're going to preach those three next week. Three things that God prepares Gideon with to defeat the Midianites. But today I want to just ask you, what has kept you in the wine press? What are you afraid of? Perfect love casts out all fear. Would you stand with me this morning? I believe there are some people here today, and you may not want to admit it. You don't have to come down forward to pray today. We're going to play a little bit of music in the background today. We don't have a big invitation song. But right where you're at today, did you know that God himself wants to be with you? He wants to reveal his presence to you, that you would experience his relationship face to face, that you could name this place, the Lord is peace. The Lord is peace. You don't have to be afraid today. Whatever has kept you in the wine press, feeling the crushing weight, God's ready to take you out. God's ready to pull you out. He may have an altar for you to pull down in your backyard. He may. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? just by an uplift hand this morning, would you say, Pastor, I've been in that wine press. I've been hiding out of fear. I know there are some things that have paralyzed my life 
out of fear. And I've been hiding. I have felt the crushing weight of that fear. Would you just raise your hand right now for me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hands all over this place. This morning, in just a moment, I'm just going to open these altars, and we're just going to make this place a quiet house of prayer for just a few moments. But I want to tell you today, one of the greatest wraths that we feel is the convicting power of the Spirit that's saying we're not ready to meet him should we die. Three Sundays ago, one of our members that had just been coming here a few months was getting ready to be part of our production, was here on Sunday morning, and Monday morning, he didn't wake up from a massive heart attack. And I don't say that to scare you. I say that because it's a reality. Every one of us, if Jesus does not come back, guess what's going to happen to us? We're all going to die. It's just the truth. Now, Paul was pretty cool that he said to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. But he said, uh, no, that's the scripture I want to say is to live is Christ, to die is gain. Thank you, Jesus, for that. To live is Christ, to die is gain. So it is okay that one day we will all die. What's not okay is if you don't know him as your Savior. So this morning, the biggest weight that you can feel lifted off of you is to give your life to Jesus and let him pull you out of the wine press. I'm going to open this altar in just a moment, and I just, if you raised your hand and you just want to pray with us down front, that's great. If you don't because you're intimidated, that's okay too. Just pray where you are. Father, I thank you for your peace that you give us when we encounter you. Thank you for relationship with you. Lord, today you want to take us out of the wine press. Take us to the hill. Oh, Lord, there's so much more in that passage that I want to share. Today, Lord, you want us to deal with our fear. So, Lord, today as we open this altar, Lord, would you just be real? Be that present hope, that present grace. Lord, if there's anybody here that does not know you know you as their Savior, I pray that today they would make you Lord, that we would give you our life. Thank you for loving us. In the name of Jesus. If that's you today, you just want to pray with us down front, the altar's open. If not, you can be seated this morning for just a moment. But I ask, let's not waste this opportunity to pray, church. You may be a believer and not even really need anything. Just pray. Stand if you'd like, sit if you'd like, kneel with us if you'd like. But let's make this place a house of prayer for just a moment.